everybody, and welcome to an extravagant wild ride with Steve-O. We have Lisa Vanderpump. Are you kidding me? Come on. Who would have thought that Lisa Vanderpump and Steve-O were buddies? And I will tell you, we are. And man, she's not doing interviews with all of this scandal, all of this controversy, all of this news around her empire and her cheating TV people, man, we're the ones who got to talk to her. And we talked to her about everything. So strap on your seatbelts and let's get into it. Here we go. You want this closer? Um, just a little bit. I it think has. it should it should work pretty well. Oh, so sexy. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Lisa oh, Vanderpump. Oh. So happy to be here with this beautiful bee. Yep, this is Wendy from Peru. Mm, thank you for rescuing her. Well, thank you. Thank you for being the most elegant, uh, classy person to be in our dingy podcast van. Yeah, but it's <laughs> pink lights. It's got a dog. I don't need anything else. What else is there? I, I, I have to say that I was not concerned with... Uh, having you in here I, I, I as elegant as you are i i, I oh, know you well I enough get down and dirty with the best of them hey i think it's a compliment actually yeah. to have me in here i love it I, I love it and and people uh might find us an odd pairing but we've we've, we've, we've <laughs> we were friends. talking about that we earlier. were just talking about that <laughs> yeah. i mean like when i got the message steve i want you to just podcast because i had been turning down press or doing anything because of what happened on band of Pump rules it kind of right. kicked off it's had like hundreds of billions of views literally in the last few weeks i said tell steve for him, I'll do anything. Well, not anything, but, you know, within the realms yeah. of doing podcasts. Um, I, I love it. It does feel like kind of a juicy time. And, and thank you for being oh here. God, what a nightmare it's been. But you know what? We're dealing with it. And uh, reality it's, television is always so unpredictable. And as a producer of that show, I've seen the, you know, it ebbs and flows. And it's really flowing now, babe. Is it really a nightmare? A I mean, reality TV show? I mean, no, no, but like the, this whole situation with the cheating scandal, like, yes, it's a nightmare because people's feelings were hurt and, and such, but from the lens of a producer, is it not the greatest thing that could ever happen? <laughs> well, obviously, you look for great ratings and it has produced that. But after 11 years, and these people, kids, they were when they first started working for me about 14, 15 years ago, I'm very emotionally invested in them. So I feel I've been on so many journeys with them. Of course, it's fantastic television, but a great, at a great price, you know. I mean, and also it was so unexpected. We weren't filming then, you know, we weren't prepared right. for this. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we've just shot the reunion <clears throat> and it was very very intense and emotional and i love them all for all their kind of follies and foibles you know i love them all very much not as much as i love you though i love this dog it, thank you as i say for, the rest yeah, for sure <laughs> we give money to peru um our band of pump dog foundation so thank you for yeah. bringing her back that tom sandoval yes is gorgeous is he not? I think Ariana might disagree with you right now. <laughs> <laughs> I think she referred to him as a piece of shit in the reunion. Right. I mean, with that said, he is one good looking piece of shit. Well, a, lot of, a lot of them are. I mean, they're all beautiful people. I sat down at the reunion and I looked around and I was just like, even Andy said, God, you are all. So, I mean, it's Hollywood. So, right. you know, a lot of great looking people come through the door of restaurants that, you know, and, and I employ them of course in hollywood it's like you've got the pick of the litter so to speak um but lala look at her she is extraordinary looking i mean all the girls um they're a great looking bunch and uh, they kind of take advantage of that when it comes to um getting down and dirty and naughty yeah <laughs> um we asked artificial intelligence i'm not quite sure how we went about it but i know that we did we asked what does steve-o and lisa vanderpump have in common and shockingly artificial intelligence said that we have nothing in common except for um 
where do we have a, a public profile as celebrities? Oh, bullshit. I have so much in common with you. We've talked about mental health. We've talked about depression. We've talked about work, dedication to work, being ambitious, a love of dogs. I've saved, yeah. what is it, 3,000 dogs down in America and thousands <coughs> around the world. Um, we have a sanctuary in China. I know you're a huge animal advocate and dog lover, so we have that. Yep, got to believe you were born in England. Yes, you were born Me in too. Wimbledon, right? Yep. Yeah, I grew up in England, though. Did you or not? I grew up in five different countries, but my formative years really were in England. Right, where did you go to school? Uh, at the American School in St. John's Wood. Oh, wow. My daughter was born in St. John's Wood. Yeah. yeah. It's well, a posh part of town. Yeah. Where is that? In London or like... Yeah, like in North London. London. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, hmm. mm. yeah kind of... Did you have a favorite soccer team when you lived in London? <laughs> no. Uh, another thing we have in common, we both got our start in the restaurant industry. Yes. I was a bus boy. Oh, were you? <laughs> if yeah. I had known you were a bus boy, I would have definitely had you on Mad Bob Rules. Yeah. Can you imagine? You could, I could just take you back in time. we got to do that. Were you any good? I was absolutely awful. Uh, did you ever run food or you just bust? Um, actually, I started my first thing. I was a dishwasher. Uh, in a pub in London. Yeah. And I was what the was worst, like? I was the worst, <laughs> slowest dishwasher. I think I got fired after two days. You know what? <laughs> My kids, because they, you know, they've had a very privileged life. We lived in South of France for years. We had all the trappings. And when they wanted to work in the restaurant industry, they started washing dishes. Then they started um, busting, great. you know, busting tables. Then they started running food, managing no, they, then it was uh, serving, but for five, seven years or whatever, just so they understood, you know, the industry. And now they're kind of managers and Pandora's gone to kind of create her own business. But I think it's very, very good to start at the bottom. Your dog loves me more than yeah. you. Can you see that? <laughs> that is a dog that knows you got this, right? She's just like, I'm home. Yeah, she's she's really uh she's We have really a special. lot in common. You guys and are I both on a... Dancing with the Stars? Ooh, oh, God, yeah. that was awful. <laughs> that, I, was I always say thing. that, too. It was so hard. I mean, I know it's not as hard as jumping off a mountain or doing all the ridiculous things that you do, but that was really hard. And I was filming a reality show at the time, so doing two shows, it was so... I lost so much weight. I was shaking all the time because I felt so... You know, because you'd have to exercise like six hours a day, weren't you? You were Because yeah. it was so complicated, right? I was just like that. Nearly and me. my experience was that no matter how many hours I put into rehearsals, <laughs> there was no, no hope way. for me. <laughs> <laughs> no, no one, like, like, I mean, I, I, I might as well have not rehearsed because nothing was going to help me. And how far did you go? First uh, week? I, I lasted six weeks. Oh, I lasted, wow. yeah, a few weeks. Well, and then I fainted in rehearsal, but by <laughs> then I was I had a virus. I was, like, weak. I, but, yeah, I I lasted quite a, yeah, a few dances, but it was it was very stressful. It's, uh... Your it, body's not used to doing that. Right. I mean, to, like, dance that many hours a day, mm -hmm. it's pretty hard. It is, really. I, when people ask me, I was like, eh, don't do it. Eh. Yeah, it's... It, it, and I, I was very surprised to learn that you were on Dancing with the Stars. Were you? Yeah. Why? What are you saying? I want... What's the subliminal message to that? I, I was <laughs> just... I was just surprised by it. I thought that... I, th I view it as... Uh, something that people don't do during the peak of their career. Oh, and right. I, Good I point. Think, I and think... I wanted to do it. I actually wanted to do it. And at that time, I had found a pump rules, and I was also on Housewives. I think at that time they said they'd never have a housewife because I think there were so many of them. And I was just like, yeah, but I'm not just a housewife. I'm, you know, I have found a pump rules. And they said, okay, we'll, we'll give it a shot. But I... I thought it was an extraordinary experience. I was hanging on for dear life every week. I felt so emotionally connected to my dance partner. Like every time I looked at him, it was like, you're going to save my life just as the music started. But it was really difficult. Yeah, it was really difficult. Yeah. And what about the voice? Have you, uh, not the voice, the uh, masked singer. Have they asked you to do that? They right? did. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> they, 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 they did. And, uh, did you say I, no? I, yeah, I was not That interested. looks scary, doesn't it? <laughs> that looks like a scary situation. I'm not a karaoke guy. 
<laughs> I mean, uh, they would be able to tell so fast that it was you anyway. I wonder. Yeah. That you lasted longer as a dancer than a busboy. <laughs> <laughs> that tells yeah. you anything. Um, the, yeah, the more I think about it with the, the Dancing with the Stars, um, I, I was on it a little bit earlier. For me, I had just gotten out of rehab. I was yeah. living in a halfway house. I, yeah. it, was, it was like I was this kind of a transformation story that really worked for them. Right. And I was terrified of, of um, you know, getting back into like work in the entertainment industry. And this was just a way of dipping my toe in the water. That's so. not dipping your toe in the water. That is bloody scary. It's because true. Because if you did it, when, <laughs> yeah, if you did it when I did it, when it was like two shows a week, did you do it when it was two shows a week? Because um, I did it was Monday, Tuesday. So you have one less day to rehearse and another live performance. Then they would do the results the next day. That's what it was right. like. It was for, two, yeah, I remember yeah. there being two days. How many years ago did you do it? I did it in uh, 2009. Oh, yeah. Then it was two days. And they were, like, yeah. getting 20 million. I mean, it was pretty intimidating. Yeah, 20 million yeah, viewers. Yeah, viewers, right? <laughs> to see you totally God. screw up. Right. <laughs> I know. It, so you, you, you're absolutely right. Where I was saying dip my toe in, it, it, it didn't require me to do anything risky or, or to travel. Like, I could rehearse right down the street from my little halfway I house. I think so. it is risky. Sorry. It was, it was terrible. <laughs> Not for you. It might be for anybody else. That is risky. In in hindsight, it was more pressure than it made any sense for exactly. me to be under yeah. at that early stage yeah. of my sobriety. And I barely made it through. Because you'd want to drink if ever you yeah. wanted a drink you'd want to drink that. <laughs> yeah I, I, for sure. I absolutely wanted a drink and there were times i reached out to people saying like hey i'm not okay did and you I, really yeah i reached out to you know mentors in sobriety so I'm, I'm not okay and <laughs> that's I got, what i'm saying it's just <laughs> such a stressful situation yeah, what, you, what were you not okay about i was just not okay so with the the just the, the the pressure the stress the you know like the the exposure i was just so afraid i was so exactly. vulnerable i was so worn down i was <laughs> it's just such a different so situation. scared yeah and how much time sober it. did you have I, I, I turned one year sober during Dancing with the oh, Stars. Oh, wow. Right. Right. And, and I got Who really good advice. Who was your partner, actually? Uh, it was Lacey Schwimmer. Oh, I know her. She's lovely, right? Is she long girl? Is she? she had dark hair. Oh, perfect. I don't know her at all. I know the name. I know the yeah. name. I think she was there when I was there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, remember, I remember one guy I reached out to gave me the, some of the best advice I ever got. He said, what was it? He, he said, hey. Um, he said, <laughs> he, he, he said, uh, he said, I, I understand. He says, sometimes you're not going to be okay. And, and that's, that's fine. But when you don't feel okay, uh, the one thing you can do that will always help is it, stick a cool cup your ass when you have diarrhea. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I do not want to not be okay in front of 20 million people. <laughs> Wear <Right>. a diaper. <laughs> he said the one thing you can do is conduct yourself as a gentleman because uh, no matter how bad you feel, if if you do the right thing, if you if you if you're a gentleman, if you're kind, if you're you know, then you've got that to feel good about, and that will always improve how you feel. I like so, that. So, did you conduct yourself as a gentleman? I struggled. <laughs> I went in and out of it, but but just that, and that, that's something that I could really hang on to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. What now, did you think you took from it in the end? Did you think okay, because you. <laughs> basically accomplished so many extraordinary things in fact i was watching some of you recently of things that you have said i couldn't do that ah the stunts i backed out yeah of. and i, I was thinking yeah you. what you know what what would make you back out i mean there's nothing i would do that you've ever done one i don't have testicles to the, you know, stable to my <laughs> maybe, I'll, maybe I would actually staple somebody else's to my leg. Right? That could be something I do. That, my husband's, I'm sure he deserves it. That sounds like sharing needles. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I remember seeing this thing, God, I don't know where you were. And you said, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. And I thought, at what point do you get to 
where you think, okay, you know what, fuck it, I'm just going to go for it. And you had like these big wings on yeah. and they threw you off a bridge or something. Yeah. And to me, I would just look at it like I was going to die. If I was ever going to be in that situation, I couldn't ever see myself coming back from that. I would either die of a heart attack on the way down, but right. I, it certainly would kill me. That That is, how many feet did you drop it off the bridge? It was over 200, I believe, over 200 feet. But let me ask you this then. What was the difference between that and when we did it in South what you did it in South Africa? Um, that was the tallest bridge in the world. Right. And you guys were like amped to do it. Not amped to do it, but I um <laughs> was uh deliberate about about facing this fear. I have an unbelievably intense and irrational fear of roller coasters, bungee jumping, skydiving. Are you skydiving. kidding me? I well, swear. you wouldn't go on a roller coaster with me, but you'd jump up a 200-foot mountain I with a pair of wings. I, I, I'm, I'm going to go on a roller coaster, I believe, next week um, because we need to... Um, Measure the amount of stress that I'm going to be under with my That's whoop funny. band. I remember we were driving, <laughs> we were driving down the coast from Oregon, and uh, we were in his uh, another van that he had, and I and I turned a corner too sharp, and we were at like a cliff's edge, but oh, God. it was on a freeway, and Steve's in the passenger seat going ah. And I'm yeah. like, what are you doing? You're, he's like, you're getting too close to the edge. Yeah. And he just was like screaming. Well, that, I think it's like me. I'm a control freak. I don't want to put yeah. my destiny in somebody else's hands. Yeah. I feel like that every time I get in the car with Ken. But it's a legitimate fear because he's basically validated that fear because he's had so many minor, you know, reverse into this, rear ending that, you know, like, whereas I touch wood. I mean, I've been driving for like, you know, 40 years. Uh, since I was like a teenager and I don't think I've ever had an accident you know somebody's run mm. into me so like with Ken I always see everything before he sees it you know I'm like oh by the way that was a stop sign not a suggestion it's actually a stop sign <laughs> you know like oh god that's it's 100% like, yeah. lux yeah. Yeah. in me yeah, yeah. <laughs> what, what is it about roller coasters though that you think they're going to come off the track or I, is it just the... I just don't like the way it feels let me tell you I like to feel good and I also like to look good. And I'm guessing we've got some new listeners because Lisa Vanderpump is maybe a little bit outside of my demographic. So let me tell everybody how I go about looking good and feeling good. And it is with my diet, baby. I have a cheat code that you need in your life. It's called AG1 from Athletic Greens. It is the most comprehensive and convenient, not to mention delicious, nutritional supplement you can get. It, it's this green powder. You scoop it into a pint of water to start your day off hydrated and with every gap in your diet filled. Why does it fill the gaps? Because it's loaded with 75 different vitamins, minerals, whole food sourced superfoods, probiotics, adaptogens. I'm telling you, the list goes on and on and on. It's the best stuff you can put in your body. I swear by it every day. That is why I feel so good. And you can get if you go to athleticgreens.com slash stevo with your first purchase you can get five convenient comprehensive ag1 travel packs plus an entire year's supply of immune boosting vitamin d it is a great deal i encourage you to jump on it and to do so again go to athleticgreens.com slash stevo now let's get back to it what your stomach but that's yeah. it you gotta feel like that when you jump off a bridge right but i uh i, I don't like it <laughs> <laughs> and Too late. It, it, it boils down to i think the reality about me is that i am not an adrenaline junkie i'm simply an attention whore oh i see so it's basically superseded by the attention when Correct. you're doing something whereas on the roller coaster nobody's really interested because you're one of many right. ah, i get it I that's don't, actually mm. interesting yeah i don't do the things i do for for enjoyment i do it for attention well so Dancing with Stars, you had 20 million yeah. sets of eyes on you then, right? Yeah, and, and I found that like super uncomfortable too. There's yeah. like a paradox about being an attention whore where you're, you, you crave the attention, but you also really are intimidated by yeah. it. Like when I was in school, 
as a you know a, a young schoolboy or whatever in my you know when I got up in front of the class to give a presentation, I would be the kid with his voice really shaking. Yeah, I was yeah, so nervous. Yeah. And, you know. I think that's, you know, I, I'm actually writing a book. God help me. Simon Schuster, like, when is this book ever going to arrive? You know, arrive at, and I'm having, because I want to write it myself, which is kind of foolish because now it needs organizing and I need segues because I just kind of basically, I've written 53,000 words and now they've got to try and put it together and tell me what mm. we need to make sense of it, you know? Um, but it's just like some things you think, oh, I've got this, I can do this. And then it's such a challenge, you know, and it's just like discipline, trying to get myself to do that. Like I'm good, spur of the moment, get things done, I can do it. You know, yeah. like designing, opening restaurants, doing it. But then when there's something that just, I think, why can't I do this? Why cannot, why can't I finish it? You know, it's like yeah. very, very difficult. I, I've, I've, um published two books have you did you write them yourself or I, did you I have worked help? with the writer yeah that's what I should have done I should have done that. yeah and um, the the first book came out in 2011 the second book came out in 2022 I, and the guy I wrote the books with did nothing but write books in between for that whole yeah. decade yeah and on the second book I asked him is there no now you've done all of these books is there anybody else who's been more of a like a meticulous, like psycho. Oh, you were psycho. really, were like you said, like no that one, with it? Every no word. No one came close. Yeah, every word. Yeah. Like an absolute psycho. Yeah, sure. I need to like hand it over and, and give it. And I think, oh my God, you know, like I got to finish this. I mean, now it's serious. I really actually do have to. Otherwise they're going to tell me to piss off, you know, because, yeah. but it's, yeah. It's, what is it, it about? Well, it's about everything I've done, you know, in my life. I mean, I've kind of raised two kids, been married 40 <laughs> years. I've moved in three countries, opened 35 restaurants, have my own <clears throat> charity, uh, done 600 episodes of reality television, produced half. Yeah. Them. It's all the different things I've done. It's about, um, it's about mental health as well, about how I've dealt with it. You know, I lost my brother to suicide a few years ago. We kind of talked like that. It's about just trying to cope in the world and things that scare you and things that you think are insurmountable, how we get over it, how we challenge ourselves. Um, there's just so many things in this book that really just come from a wealth of experience. And so many people... When I do, I do a lot of public appearances um, in terms of like, you know, rosé, like I'll go and, and I'll kind of be at one of the shops and a thousand people will show up and they'll be there for hours. And, and these people, when they get to me in the line, I will not leave till every single person is hugged, acknowledged, listened to, yeah. because I really appreciate, you know, even in my restaurant, I really try to do that. But it's like all these people, they connect to me on so many different levels. If it's not being an LGBTQ activist, you know, always being an advocate. I've had gay bars for years. I've always, you know, never understood the discrimination between two people and, and sexuality and sexual orientation. I just cannot understand how people, you know, so many young people are thrown out on the street, the you know, homeless youth, the LGBTQ, yeah. you know. So, and the suicide, I've worked with suicide prevention, Trevor Hotline, prior to my brother, you know, committing suicide. I never oh. thought it would touch our life, ever. Um, he wasn't LGBTQ, he wasn't, he was, you know, been married for years and got two wonderful sons, and so that devastated me. Um, but I meet these people and they talk to me about dogs because so many people love our furry friends and they know that I've saved thousands of dogs and I'm really passionate about that. Even one of my taglines for Bravo was I'm passionate about dogs, just not crazy about bitches. And they said, you can't say that. You're not allowed to have the bitch word in the title. And I said, but why not? I'm talking about the dogs. In the end, they let it go. So I said, well, I'm not saying anything else. I kind of learned to put my foot down a little bit with, you know, like yeah. those. Um, and then they would kind of connect to me over marriage things. I've been married for so long. I adopted my son, Max, who you gave yeah. the skateboard to. I said to him, I'm going to do your podcast. I'm so jealous. I said, well, maybe you could sit in. And he's just like, no, you don't want me sitting there. and be like, yeah. Um, but adoption, you know, people talk to me about um, business. So I, I get so many emotional mm. connections. I think my book's going to be a little bit about all of that, about what I wish I'd done, what I have done, what I would do better, and where I feel I've had a modicum of success. 
Yeah. yeah. My and this is going to be your second book. I did a cookbook, which was so much easier. <clears throat> if anybody's thinking of writing a book, and you're kind of have a, had a you know little small piece of celebrity, a cookbook with a few stories, the way to go. So easy really? to start to do this. So fifty three thousand <clears throat> words. I'm still not there yet. It's like when is this? I feel like I'm writing the Bible. You know, yeah. it's like a war and peace. It's like when am I going to finish it? And then it kind of gets pushed to the bottom of the pile but i will in the next couple of months i will deliver so i'm going to choose to if you're listening do not be scared i will deliver at some point it's the my second book yeah was uh, a book of wisdom what i've learned from a lifetime of terrible decisions really yeah and was it funny or was it it's, kind of- it was in turns funny tragic like sincere like it was it was it was all of that what would you say, not putting you on the spot, and like, By what, all means, what put would you me say? What, no, well, what would you say is one of the most important things that you've learned really through this whole experience? You know, absolutely, the most important thing I've learned in my life is how crucial it is to identify your passion. Full stop. I think that most people's biggest problem in life is that they have not identified something about which they are absolutely I do agree. Passionate. Well, I agree because I always say find a job you love, then you never have to work a day in your life. You know, the motivation comes from the want yeah. because otherwise it's very difficult to get yourself, you know, going. And, and like, I love what I do. Right. I love creating new restaurants. I love the hospitality and um, industry. Um I actually love producing reality television, even though sometimes, as we say, like now, it's been very kind of emotionally draining, just doing the reunion, sitting there for 10 hours Mm -hmm. and watching all these emotions. And and these people really give it all. They don't sit there in the corner. They're kind of, I'm not saying they're trained because they're not trained at all, but they're kind of people that are good for reality television, are people that really express themselves honestly. And when you do 10 hours of that and they're all sitting there, that's a lot of honesty, a lot to deal with. But yeah, I agree with you. I do agree with following your passion and finding it and tapping into that. Um, I think one of the things that I feel that's really important is and we were just talking about this um in the kitchen i was talking with scott you know just before i came in that i think humility and i don't mean be humble but really understanding that you know we're all human beings we all have and you might get some success or you might be you know famous or you might be you know wealthy from great choices you've made and everything but still being down to earth and sure. kind and identifying with everybody, I think it's really, really important. And, um, yeah. you know, like you say, oh, will you get in the truck? Damn right, I'll get in the fucking truck. I'll drive it across the country. You know what I mean? I'm not the, <laughs> you know right. what I mean? I'm not that. Yeah. I'm still in there picking up dog shit. It doesn't matter how many people I've got helping me. You know, I've got six dogs. It's like... Um, yeah, just always keeping your feet on the ground and not ever thinking you're better than anybody else because right. you're not. You right. might have more luck, you might have more talent, but you're not better than anybody else. And doing my podcast, I met so many incredible people and everybody had a story to tell and everybody, you know, taught me something. And I love that. I love that. I love conversation. There's a saying that I heard, which I really, really love, and it's simple. We are all eyes in the same head. Meaning that the like the the concept of oneness, we are all one. Yeah. Like God yeah. is God is everything, or God are is. Are you nothing. religious? Not religious, spiritual. Oh, and, I'm religious. Yeah, the, I definitely. I always think you've got to believe in something. Yeah. Yeah, and and the universe is everything. Yeah. And all of creation is an exercise in the universe experiencing itself. Yeah. So, like, like we we are all divine because we're all little pieces of the one big thing, and so you're every bit as divine as I am, no matter who you are. You know, when I met you, I mean, you're so iconic in your, I mean, I can't say genre because there's nobody else like you really per se, but I just was always, I was always impressed by how kind you were. And I think that is more impressive to me. And I meet a lot of people because I have 
restaurants and you know yeah. especially like in vegas and you know opening mm-hmm. restaurants I, I meet a lot of people that come through and uh i think often people lose their way a little bit with success and they think that defines them and it makes them superior and i've seen people with money listen i don't give a shit how much money you've got because unless you gonna bring a bag of it to me at dinner fuck <laughs> off i don't need it i don't need an attitude either you know right. but you do see people like that um and they think that it gives them and it's like i i have met some people i tell you you'll never think that. dominico dolce who dolce gabbana right okay. i remember in fact i might actually see him shucks i think that he, but i remember when he came to my house and huge brand hugely successful and i remember he came to my house with his partner and he came in i remember saying dominico what would you like to drink and he said oh bella i drink what you are drinking and i was like oh okay well yeah sure i'll van from rosé give him a glass of rosé so i said uh dominico what what would you like to eat i eat what you are eating that and the kindness how wonderful this person was it always resonated with me and has since become a great friend and i remember when jiggy died he sent this three piece suit he knew ken always used to carry jiggy around and jiggy was kind of iconic he'd been on hundreds of episodes of reality television and he'd inspired the van pump dog foundation and this three piece suit arrived for ken in in the post and i thought well that's really unusual for him to send a suit it was a few weeks after jiggy had died and inside the coat and the lining were all pictures of jiggy mm. and i thought he has to be one of the kindest most considerate and also extremely wealthy extremely successful but never ever lost a second of yeah. that you know and yeah i've seen other people have made a lot of money that just treat people like shit treat yeah. staff like shit and we say you know, if you if you want to know somebody's true personality <clears throat> see how they treat the server in a restaurant yeah they say you can um what is it you can measure man's worth uh, by the way he treats people who have no importance to him yeah actually a server is really important to you <laughs> uh, right. yeah wow yeah, that's but, pretty yeah. crazy yeah, yeah. if you're on a date I, I with agree. somebody in the, it, oh and they're dismissive of yeah that's a red flag yeah, for I, sure. I dated a girl one time who who was rude to the and i i was just completely turned put, off yeah put you off yeah how, for sure how can you recover from that yeah i've never I mean, even I, i've never even really thought about it in terms of like the the importance of people i just think that it's a spiritual axiom that the way we treat others is a reflection of how we feel about ourselves exactly but it, there is tr- there's a lot of truth in it if you're going to be only be nice to people who are important yeah yeah for sure I mean, imagine serving tables and there's like get over here yeah, yeah. you know yeah. and like the yeah. guy has to do it cuz it's he's in the service industry but yeah. it's like it's humiliating yeah yeah that's I served tables for 20 years and it's just Did like, you yeah yeah. Food runner, busboy, wow, everything, yeah. and it was just. I, I'm super grateful I don't have that problem. That uh, yeah, that that, and sometimes they don't tip, so like yeah. they, they treat you oh. like dog shit and they don't tip, and you're oh, like, yeah, yeah. Huh. My father said never get in a taxi unless you can afford to give him a tip. You yeah. don't belong in there unless you can afford to give him a tip. I learned that from my father. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. Yeah. Um, now with my father. Uh, is he still alive? He is. My, yeah, my, not, mine not, is too, yeah. not my mother, but my father. Yeah, same as me. My mother died recently. Yeah. And my father was a quite wildly successful businessman. He was, uh, um, you know, a corporate executive for American multinational companies. And this is why I grew up in five different countries. Because oh, my God. I can only imagine when he starts seeing your antics. And what. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And... Not many times, but there were times when I floated up the idea of like, oh, like, you know, open up a restaurant. And dad has always been so insistent that the worst business idea possible <laughs> is, is to restaurant. open a restaurant. Well, statistics are against you. Most of them fail. <laughs> well, most yeah. fail within the first three years. Yeah. And and then, wh- I why mean, is that? Oh, gosh, it's very, very challenging. And I don't think it's getting any easier. I mean, what I'm loving personally is developing my brand with Caesars because they just have this extraordinary body of people and corporation. But you know what? 
right at the top of Caesar's Palace, all the people from the people that own it, the Carano family, you know, it's a public company, but to the managing directors, they are all so kind, so nice, and it's just such a pleasure to work with them. And I really enjoy kind of doing that. I've opened in the Paris Casino, I think arguably one of the most beautiful restaurants in Las Vegas. I did it with my uh, design company, Van der Pumper Lane, and then we have another one in Caesar's Palace, and then we're opening another two with them so far. Um, but it's much easier for me. I come up with the concept, build them out, design everything right down to what the waiters wear, you know, the, the cover of the check, everything. I mean, do everything, the menu, and then they run it. And for me, as we're getting older, you know, it's a, a real welcome relief rather than, you know, my restaurants in West Hollywood. It's a lot of work. It's a real, you know. But it wasn't always like that for you. I mean, in the beginning, I'm sure you had some failures. What what went wrong in the business <laughs> industry? <laughs> Do not associate me with failures. No. Okay. <laughs> And just like Lisa Vanderpump, I strive to be successful as well. And I want to help you become successful by encouraging you to have your own thriving business online. That's right. E-commerce is the way, and that way, ladies and gentlemen, is called ShipStation. This is for everybody with e-commerce operations. No matter how you're selling your stuff, if it's on Amazon, Etsy, your own website, then it doesn't matter because all of those platforms can be brought into this easy to use interface along with all of your different shippers like FedEx, UPS, United States Postal Service. And on top of that, they give you the lowest rates possible. Rates that are normally for a Fortune 500 companies, you get to enjoy, super easy. When your order comes in, it prints out the label, you slap it on the box, and it's out the door. It makes life so easy, and it helps you be successful like Lisa Vanderpump and Stevo. Now, to enjoy a 60-day free trial, you go to ShipStation.com and use the promo code Stevo. Again, that is 60 days, two months of hassle-free, stress-free shipping with ShipStation. And they're so sure you're going to love it. It's a 60-day risk-free trial. So go to ShipStation.com, use the promo code Stevo, and make ship happen. Yeah, dude. Now let's get back to it. <laughs> Maybe that's the difference in your mindset. I walked away from some, like in COVID, we walked away from Villa Blanca because the lease had run out. It was just a few months before the lease was running out. And we said, look, to the landlord, we'll, you know, pay you half. Uh, you know, through COVID because we're closed, obviously. And he said, no, I want the whole rent, which was something like $80,000. more. I said, bye, see ya. And then the place is still uh, available three years later. He hasn't been able to, you know, sometimes you need to. But I know. mean, it's, it's, when you start a restaurant now, it's going to be a success, no questions asked. But, it, but, well, not restaurant necessarily, number but one yeah, through five, yeah. were they like that? Were the first restaurant you did? I was think it, it was much easier to do uh, if you came up with a great product and a great, you know, um, location in London. There's so many people walking around. If you get it right, you're going to, okay. you know, you're going to hit the jackpot. And we, yeah, we've had a total of something, 30 something restaurants in London. Um, bars, clubs, uh, crazy pubs. clubs. Yeah, no, well, more wine bars and not really pubs, but we've had, like, we've had a couple of crazy clubs that were so avant-garde. Even I would be like, holy cow, you know, in London in that day. We owned the Shadow Lounge, which was one of the most popular gay bars in London. Um, so, in a way, have I seen it all? Yeah, I've seen it all and then some, in, in some respects. Um but, yeah, I just work really hard, and I try to kind of check all the boxes, but it's not easy. I wouldn't recommend anybody like your father <laughs> goes in the restaurant business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so you've always had the Midas touch with restaurants. I don't know. I, I don't know if it's the Midas touch. Maybe it's just a lot of hard work and uh, tenacity, so to speak. But I do think... L.A. is harder because it seems like everything has to be destination. You don't have the passing trade as much or people walk right. along thinking, oh, that looks nice. They've got to go there. You know, it's, yeah. uh, that it's a different thing. New York is easier. I haven't tried New York and I like to only be, um, 
you know, a kind of advocate for what you should do when it comes from a wealth of experience rather than, so I don't know. I've been asked to open in many, many different places over the years. But Vegas is, should be tough, right? Vegas is a fan fucking tastic. <laughs> it really is. There's people there, there's an energy, they want to go out, they want a great product, they're going to walk into Vanderpump à Paris in Paris and they're going to feel like they're in France. I lived in France for years and it's beautiful and you feel immersed in the experience. Walk into the cocktail garden, it's like an oasis. So I go with, yeah. and that's also why I've never really created a chain because what's exciting for me is creating a new project. Like my new one that I'm doing I'm not allowed to say. When's this coming out? I'm not allowed to say. But uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm not allowed to say. But my new projects, I haven't announced it yet, will be a total individual concept. And I love that, you know. Yeah, I we're heading out to that. Vegas in a, to, tomorrow. We oh, should stop are by you? one of the restaurants. Is this, yeah. is this truck going to Vegas? It's, it's, it's because I might be sitting in this seat going <laughs> with you. <laughs> the, uh, we're taking the tour bus. Are to, you? To, to, Why, what are you going to do there? We got Arizona and we got Vegas. But what are you, what are you actually going to do there? Um, we we are recording with the the lead singer of Tool tomorrow oh. in in Phoenix or not Phoenix but in Arizona. And the day after that, we're recording with Steve Aoki, the DJ in Vegas. Oh right, yeah. so that's going to be fun, right? Yeah, yeah. So well, you must go fun. there, and you must go there. Check yeah, it now out. in Caesar's Palace, it's yes. you and Gordon Ramsay. Is that right? Well, not together. Right, no. not together, but both have restaurants oh, in yeah. Caesar's Palace. Yeah, for sure. So does that make you guys, and, and probably other dynamics, make you guys bitter rivals? No, we love each other. Yeah. Really great. In fact, my new restaurant is going to be um, right next to him as well. We're really good. Good together. I think we're polar opposite in terms of what he does. I have great respect for Gordon. I think he's just genius, and I think he's been great television over the years. Um, and he, he just, I wouldn't try. I will always do my research of what I'm going to deliver. I'm very ambiance-driven. You know, he's he looks more like chef-driven. You know, you see, you yeah. know that you're going to go in there and get the best beef wellington or, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of. When, when um, you're doing a restaurant, are is the goal to get a Michelin rate? Rating? Oh, God, no. No, not no. at all. But Gordon's I, would be, right? That's the reason why he would start a restaurant? No, I don't think so. I think he's pretty commercial, but he wants to deliver a, a, just a great product, you know. I love Gordon, too. Yeah, he's great. And he's, you know, he's very English and he's got that sense of, you know, sense of humor. I think our sense of humor is a lot more provocative than, than American humor. You know, we have to kind of tone it down a bit. Well, mm -hmm. apart from... Ricky Gervais, he doesn't tone anything down. He's like, I don't give a fuck. Cancel me, go on, you know. Um, I think in England, our humor is kind of more aggressive, you know. But it's not only the humor, it's the, I think you guys are more graceful and, and te like, the men are more like James Bond. The women are, like, just elegant and classy. and, and Really? Yeah, well, look at you. Oh, you're you're yeah. the most graceful woman I've ever, ever met in my life. Are you serious? Yeah. I'm sitting here with my feet up and cross legs. <laughs> yeah, but you have a style about it, you uh, know? And I, it's. I love this guy. Can he follow me around? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I mean, there is a difference, right? I mean. It's yeah. the accent. It can fool you. But it's like, oh, don't worry about that, darling. Yeah, um, well, it's true. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> can, can you. Uh, paint a picture of what it was like opening the very first restaurant. Well, like I met Ken when he had a wine bar. Uh, so I met Ken when I was 21 through my brother. Um, Ken had a wine bar, so he was already just starting to get into the hospitality business. Uh, but he had this wine bar ostensibly to get laid, to meet different women, uh, to get drunk. That's why he had it. There was no yeah. business acumen that came with that at all. Then we opened another one. I kind of got involved with the design. And then we opened another one. We had a very famous restaurant in London called The Pheasant Tree, which was a really beautiful building in Chelsea. So then we built up a chain and we sold out. Um so I don't really, I don't ever feel there was a first one and I did it on my own because Ken had this initial one. But, you know, basically, as soon as he met me, I shut that shit down. Like, you know, we were going there. It was a business. It was not to get laid and it was not to get drunk, you know, because right. otherwise we weren't getting married. That was it. You know, right. that kind of changed real quick. I kind of. 
And and with the the absence of a business acumen, was his wine bar successful? Oh yeah, yeah, it was. Just because he was a cool dude. Yeah, yeah, and I think we kind of always look, you know, like even if I like I had a dinner party last night, like just casual, you know, kind of spontaneous. I look for to make a great vibe, great ambiance. I think you know. When you went into Villa Rosa, you feel the, you know, mm. I love creating spaces, beautiful spaces. They don't have to be too upscale. It can be very down to earth. I mean, when you walk into Pump, for instance, in uh, West Hollywood, you know, it's kind of got these old olive trees. That you, can, you can go in like dressed in shorts. You can be however you want to be in it. I don't want to create intimidating spaces. Um but I love the ambiance. I love the music. I love the lighting. I love the flowers. I love creating menus. I just, I love it all. I really do. Again, I found a passion, you know? Yeah. How do you feel about um, the, how loud a restaurant can be? Because it drives me nuts when you can't, when you got to scream across the oh, table. Oh, you're going to hate my restaurant. you got to scream in my restaurant. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, do do well, you have like a, um, is, is there a, an area that, that isn't quite so loud? In, no, in Steve, you're fucked. You can't. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, Steve, you're in, when I sat there in Pump, um, you know, my restaurant in West Hollywood, which, in fact, the lease is coming to the end now, and we're kind of deciding what we're going to do, whether we're going to go forward or not. Because, honestly, to have four, like, with Caesars, and then to have three here, it's quite a lot, you know, running them all at the same time. Um, with all the other things, the charity, Dog Foundation, and my design business is, uh, you know, my real passion as well. Um, but when we go into Pump... I love the fact that you can sit there and listen to music and have real ambiance. I love that, you know, about it. What I don't like is loud restaurants that it's like the acoustics are bad with chatter. You know, sometimes you go into mm -hmm. restaurants and all the kind of conversations are bouncing off the walls. I don't like that at all. If it's, you know, like people are having a drink and the lighting's great, the music's on, I like that. I think people come to our restaurant for entertainment as much as, you know, right. as much as the food. Have you ever done dining in the dark? No. You've done a lot of things in the dark, but not that. <laughs> you know, have you ever heard of it? You walk into a restaurant, I've it's completely dark. I've seen that somewhere, The yeah. servers are all blind. Why would you do that? So Because they, they say that when you shut off your one sense, the other senses enhance. And so the food <laughs> the food tastes different and more be and, and better. And like all the servers are blind, so they lead you to the table. I went on, I was on a date one time. Where was this? There is one. They have so. pop-ups. Uh, they have one in Santa Monica on Wilshire. And I did it. And I <laughs> and, and I went in <laughs> and I was eating. And I got like I, I got like panic attack because I was like, I can't see what if there's a fire. And I, and I started like getting claustrophobic in my head. And I turned my flashlight on on my phone. And the whole place freaked out. Threw a bread roll at you. <laughs> yeah, they were, they were so pissed. Really? But it was yeah. like... Uh, it was a crazy experience. I don't know. I don't really fancy that because I think I think you eat with your eyes as well. You know, yeah. for me, I'm very, very visual. I like everything to tick all the senses. You know, I don't want to just go in and it's not just about the food. It's about the whole experience. I so agree. for me. And that's why I love, like, again, working with Caesars because they give me design kind of carte blanche, you know. So... I mean, we show them what we're going to do, but my partner, Nicolaine, and I, we have these fantastical ideas and we can create something beautiful. And I think that is, that's the essence of happiness, being in surrounding where, you know, all the mm -hmm. senses are ticked. And yeah, so I'm very much a visual person. So no, no so blindfold, no, <laughs> no eating in the dark, no. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Sex in the dark's great when you've had, you know, like, uh, after all these years, you turn the lights off. <laughs> You're not seeing this again. You just don't go back to memories of what it was like. Right? Yeah, I, I like that. Um, t tell us about your design stuff. Oh, I love it. I'm so lucky. It's really funny because I met my partner. Um, I walked into, he had this showroom, and I walked into the showroom and I thought, okay, now I've got very diverse taste. I, but some people always say, oh, I can see it's got your stamp on it. But, you know, I've had a very modern house. I've had an Art Deco house. I've had an old English house. I've kind of done all different styles. 
And I walked into this showroom and I ended up talking to Nate, my partner, and I said, you know what, I never say this. I said to him, we, and it's kind of strange, but I think people around knew who I was because it was only about five years ago. And I said, we are going to be doing something together. And I said, I don't know what it is, but there's going to be a project we're going to do together. And I'm not sure what it is. So then we ended up meeting and I put some of his lights in a restaurant and I thought, wow, I loved it. And then we talked about designing a restaurant together, um, which was our first one, which was the Caesars Palace one. Then we did Tom Tom, which was, you know, it's a great cocktail bar and beautiful restaurant. I think it was voted number one cocktail bar in Southern California. Beautiful, you know, with this moving clock and pieces and huge trees. And so we basically sit down and think, what do we want to create? What's the vibe we're going for? And each one is different. And to have somebody, also we make everything. So Vanderpump Lane has a factory. So Nick's always like, well, if, you know, he said, we're not going to draw it, we're not going to put it unless we can make it. So we really, really think it through. And it's like, for me, I always have this craziness in my head and this just drive to create beautiful spaces, but can never find what I want. So now to have a partner where we can make things is just, it's magic. It's magic. Like a new bar we're doing, I'm like, Nick, I really see it like this. And, and can we do it? And he's, I said, can, this is what I want it to look like. And he's like, okay, we're going to get this. We're going to get the mold. We're going to, you know, do it out of concrete. We can. Do so he facilitates a lot of our dreams, you know, and so we work on it together. And it's really just a magical, magical partnership. And I love it. You know, it really has been a great, great experience. We've been together now uh, five years and we're working on two new restaurants together. So, yeah. So it's not like designing clothing or no, bags or no, it's, it's, no. it's uh, I'd like to design everything. If it's just still, I want to design it. I love uh, visuals, as I say, I love design. But no, this is purely, you know, furniture, lighting, Almost everything. architecture. Yeah, and I love doing it. So that's really great. That's been a blessing. With the, uh, the restaurants that are featured on Vanderpump Rules, yeah. Yeah. the cast is... Like the, kind of a weird hybrid of actual restaurant employees and reality television personalities. Yeah. Is it hard to keep them in the capacity of a restaurant employee? Have you when seen they... my show? It's I... really fucking hot. <laughs> <laughs> Did she just say really hard? Because I got to tell you about Blue Chew tablets. They are delicious, and they have the same active ingredient as both Viagra and Cialis, except they only cost a fraction of the price. And for my male listeners, let me tell you, there's nothing more important than being really hard. So if you go to BlueChew.com, you can get a whole month's supply of Blue Chew tablets completely for free. That is if you use the promo code Steve. A whole month's supply of Blue Chew tablets, all you pay is five bucks for shipping. Plus, you sort out your, your prescription very easily with the online provider at BlueChew.com. And again, promo code Stevo gets you a whole month's supply of Blue Chew tablets absolutely for free. All you got to pay is five bucks for shipping. And if you're wondering whether or not that might be a lot of fun, let me assure you, it is. Man, when I chew up my Blue Chew tablet and then show my girl Lux my, my blue tongue, she screams with excitement because it's that much fun. So go to BlueChew.com, use the promo code Stevo, and let's get back to it. <laughs> I deserve a medal. Yes. <laughs> um, well... Let me say they're reality stars. Initially, they don't. The authenticity and the magic of Vanderpump Rules, I think, really came from the fact that it was an authentic group. And I think anything you try to do in reality television is never going to be as good without the authenticity. So when we started Vanderpump Rules, I had two or 300 people that worked for me. But I had this group that I knew they would go out with this one. They would sleep over at this house. There was like, you know, eight of them that really used to kind of all run around together. Oh, they would 
fight and then they wouldn't talk to each other coming in next door. I'd be like, leave it alone, just get on with your, you know, do this and do that. And they would like have an argument. I remember, you know, Andy Cohen came to me and he said, look, we're going to give you a spin off kind of more about your business. Do you want to do it about Villa Blanca and Beverly Hills? And I was like, no, too wholesome, don't want to do that. So let me think about it. And I thought, well, sir, it's got such a kind of little crazy bunch of people and it's like family situation. So I sent them a picture and it wasn't a picture that we, you know, fabricated or formulated for the pitch of just there was a picture of me sitting in this kind of chair with all the staff around me, which also looked like they've just come off the runway. I mean, they were all look, looking like models, you know. And Bravo straight away went, yeah, we want a green light, a, a sizzle reel. So we did this sizzle reel and it was so funny. It was like, well, this one used to date this one, but now this one is dating that one, but living with this one and this one, you know, and it, it was all kind of interconnected. And they basically said, yes, do a show. And I knew that there would be magic in that show because they were all so entwined. And when you're entwined and invested like, um, you know, in the relationship, the stakes are much higher. Like, yeah. you, if you put somebody in here and you don't like them and you say, oh, just, you know, get out, whatever, and you just go. But when it's got this emotional investment of a friendship that has basically been cultivated over many years, it it was always, there was always a lot. I mean, like, with, you know, the whole thing, the transgression that just basically transpired on, on Vanderpump Rules, you know, Ariana and Tom were together for nine years. And you know? on the show for that long. Yes, and they both worked for me for three or four years prior to being on the show. So when you've got those kind of stakes, it's not just like planting somebody and they bang them and you just... It, that's not what the show's about. It's about existing relationships. It's about love affairs. It's about frustrations. It's about inappropriate, you know relations as, as this you know what happened and it and it's yeah it gets complicated yeah Whew. has anybody gotten um yes <laughs> <laughs> like, they've done it all <laughs> like, with, like with uh with the fame that the show brought them didn't did anybody uh think you know I, i'm i'm too big of a star now to be working in the restaurant i'm gonna go oh you know. well that's you know that was a natural that I mean, most of them don't work for me in the restaurant now. Only a couple of them do. Like James will do his DJing. But the show, I think people have been watching it from the start, understand. Um, like I've been a mentor to Tom and Tom in creating their own restaurant. Well, not uh, restaurant bar uh, the last season, which was very frustrating. It's still on now. We're only on episode eight now. Um, well, it'll be later. I don't know when this is going to air. But um, I was saying to them, you know what, guys? It was so frustrating for them trying to get organized to open this restaurant. It cost twice as much, took twice as long as it always does. And I said, you know what? You're the only guys I know that actually want to be in the restaurant business. Everybody else I know in the restaurant business since COVID are now living in Mexico and lying on the beach. I mean, I really knew people that just said, forget it, we're done. We'll never get through this, we're done. And yeah. left. And, you know, literally left when they had three or four restaurants, just walked away. Wow. Yeah. Mm. It's a very sad time for the restaurant business. Over 100,000 restaurants closed in America. Yeah. yeah. Everything's like Postmates now, too. Yeah. But I don't think that's healthy. I think people need to get out and, you know, because right. you see, like, all these shops are empty because everybody's online. Mm -hmm. But, you know, no, I think we need to live. We need to, you know, yeah, we need to be out and about. We need to shop, touch it, feel it, buy it. You know, not just kind of, I think, that also can lead to depression, isolation, staying home. Mm -hmm. I'm very proactive. We've talked about this to fight depression because yeah. that can that would be an easy path for me to go down, you know? So I, I work hard. I exercise. I need bright light, good food to keep, you know, on an even keel. What's your uh, exercise regimen? Well, today I just showed you my foot. My horse ran over my foot. You know, I've broke my leg in seven places since I've seen you. Did I, you not know that? I did not know that. So I have a Cavalier horse, a beautiful white horse that was retired. You know the Cavalier show sure. where the horses, white horses come on? And I went to open the show like as a guest, you know, do the carpet and stuff years ago, like about seven years ago. And I said, if ever you have a horse that's retiring, you know, could I have him buy him, donate or whatever? They said, well, actually, we do have one coming up. And I went to meet and I said, please, can I have him, please? Please, please. And I'd ridden for years. But I'd often have precarious horses, you know, that would, like, you know, a little bit dangerous. And I was kind of, 
you know, a little more self-protection now as you get a bit older. You know, I wasn't 20 anymore. I was thinking I would love one of these horses. They are so smart. So I ended up with this amazing horse and I would ride him twice a week and he would live about half an hour from here. And then I was riding him last February. I was cantering him. Very, very smart horse. I put him into canter from standing still. And I said to Ken, wow, he seems frisky. And I just had COVID. I hadn't ridden him for about 10 days. He'd been ridden, but I hadn't because he has a trainer that, you know, like exercise him. And I said, I'm just going to go one more time, as you do. And he bucked. He reared. I stayed on. And then he fell. And we were galloping. And... I went over the top. I damaged my back. Luckily, didn't break my back. It was badly damaged here and my ribs. And he jumped over the top of me. So I went over the top of him. He jumped over the top of me, thankfully, and then realised he'd done wrong, you know, because he'd put a buck and a rear on. Never done that with me before. And he just stood there. I'd broken my leg in seven places. I heard it break. Well, you've probably Ugh. done that millions of times, right? You've heard, you hear that break. <coughs> I'd never broken anything before. So you had, you had rods and pins. Yeah, and... I had like, um, it's actually okay now. It's like I've got a plate there. Uh, I've got two long uh, pins and three screws here. So I broke it from here down there, seven places. But yesterday when I was getting my little ponies in, I don't know why. I, 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 I've met your this, little ponies. Yeah, see that bruise there? Yeah. Yeah, one of them ran over my foot. So normally I'd go on the treadmill. Just like, little baby ponies. They're not Did little baby. Even a little baby pony is probably <laughs> 200 pounds. So yeah, he galloped around the, the field. Yeah, didn't you try and ride them when you were here? I didn't yeah. try. I would never try to ride a baby pony. <laughs> no, no, but... he's this big. They're little, they're strong little right. motherfuckers, I'm telling you. I love them. They're miniature horses. But when they want to do something, yeah. They are 10 times stronger than we are. And he wanted to get out the gate, which they did, and end up running around the property with us chasing them. But he ran over my foot. So, yeah, I normally do the treadmill for about an hour, but probably I need a day off. Okay. Yeah. Now, the Beverly Hills, Housewives of Beverly Hills. God help me. Don't even get me started. Yes, Steve. What is that? <laughs> it just, it just <laughs> continues on. It's a, it's a force of Without nature. Without me. Without me. Oh. Yeah. yeah, I left four years ago. How about this? Yeah. My, your, your audience is going to be furious with me for my pitiful ignorance. No, listen. Hey, I, I'm fine with that. I yeah. left. There's a cloud of dust behind me. And, uh, yeah, I just did watch what happens live. And I said to Andy, you know, thank you for saying the door's always open. He nodded his head. But, um, no, so I you, just but, left. But, you, but you, you, you watch it. You continue to watch it. No, I've never, I didn't even see the season that I left in. I left, <laughs> I left. Yeah. I just left. I just turned around. I was fed up with being accused of, you know, I, I had my own spin off really for seven years prior to leaving. And uh, by the same production company in the same network, I used to film at the same time. I don't know, maybe there were feelings about that, being given my own spin off with my name on it. For and you were always the, the wealthiest of the housewives, is well, that? I don't know about that. I mean, there's, but no, but I, I, I was self made and nobody gave me anything, but I'm sure there's some of them. I don't know. You were the awesomest. Yeah, right. Okay, I'll go, let's go with that. Let's go with that. <laughs> Steve O says I was the awesomest yeah, housewife. And, and said they were all haters. Well, you said that, but yeah, you're right. Um, so they would constantly <laughs> accuse me of this or that. And the end, I was just like, I cannot do this anymore. And then actually, honestly, when I was, um, my brother died in May. Um, and I would, due to start filming Vanderpump Rules two days after his funeral and it was really difficult for me to do that but it's not a show so much about my personal life and I kind of said look I really do not I cannot talk about this I, I was absolutely my only sibling I was devastated I mean devastated um I, I can't talk about it you know and uh so I managed to get through Vanderpump Rules coming to the end of that and they said we want you to go back to Housewives and a couple of years I'd said look I don't want to do this anymore I don't want to be the target of, you know, I go through reunions, it'd be five against one screaming at me. I was just like, I can't do it. I would open the fridge and look for, if the milk was in the fridge, I'd cry. You know, I felt like very, you know, kind of a whole situation emotionally. I was like on the edge a little bit. And they said, no, no, I want you back. And I just got like into it a few episodes and there was this 
situation about this dog and they just kept coming at me saying I would give a story to some ridiculous yeah. outlet and I just said no and I kept saying no to me when you say to somebody I swear to you on my children's life that should be good enough especially yeah. coming from somebody as a you know believer right. religious and no I don't believe you I said you know what fuck off I'm done done get the fuck out of my house I, I was done I was done and I never went back they did ask me back and they asked me to carry on filming I said nope I'm halfway through the show. I'm not going back. That was it. Drew a line in the sand. I um, did but see... But I love the fact you don't know I'm on it because that means you don't watch it. Yeah, I've been... But I love the fact you knew all about Vanderpump Rules so you must watch it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, uh, I did see a video of... Uh, You're not was... going to bring out any porno that I no, did. No, no, no. No, I've never done porno. <laughs> <laughs> and if porn? I have, they never found it. No, <laughs> if it was there, they would find it. It, it. I saw a video. The title was uh, Lisa Vanderpump just, just what was it called? Just tearing people down or just like, you know, putting people in their place. Like, what was that? It's like a compilation it, it of you. It was a compilation of you of just like, letting people have it. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> and well, I, that's probably Vanderpump Rules. I think when, I remember when uh, Stasi came on, Stasi was very, you know, she, she's like, Lisa, Lisa, you hate me she wanted her job back. And I remember I went, you're not important enough to hate, sit down. <laughs> and I, that kind of I went viral, that. yeah. <laughs> I heard that. I also heard uh, that the, the part of it was you, you saying, I've never sold a story in my life and yeah. I've been Insulted by that. Yes. I, yeah. yeah. Because to me, my word is my bond. Sure. You know? And if somebody, a good friend says to you, I want to know. And I say, if I say my hand to God or I swear on my children's life, I think that should be good enough for anybody. Yeah. Because any good friend of mine, if they ever said that, I'd say a thousand percent, I believe you. Now let's figure it out, you know? So for me, just this constant... Uh, bullshit uh, uh, accusations I was like no also stories never ever came out of my restaurant ever you know over the years and I've seen everything I mean we've carried people out the back a million times you know yeah. not you but a million times. where like people so people sell their own stories to the outlets I've never sold a story because I've just no. always been so dying to get it on TMZ that like it never even occurred to me to <laughs> what do you mean, like, what, can, can you give me an example of somebody yeah. selling a story <laughs> oh, like, well, people you... sell stories all the time you could be in a restaurant you could be talking to somebody and they sell a story but you know what <laughs> this before I got to emergency when I broke my leg as I say in seven places I was put in the truck and you couldn't have anybody go with you I couldn't have Ken go with me because of COVID right Oof. and so they were like they put me in the truck and they were going across the ground you know and it was really bumpy going my leg and I was just like oh my god I knew I was just totally screwed you know and so when I got to emergency, as I came, you know, they put me on the trolley, my phone rang, TMZ. They got the story before I even got into emergency. Really? I was like, wow. So I always said to them, how do you, you know, how do you find that out? Is it the paramedics? Is it who tells you? Do you have, you know, say you have a hotline to courthouses yeah. and things like that, if there's a lawsuit or something. And they said, no, just somebody gave them a story. I said, can you tell me how much you get paid? For, you know, giving your story. They said, oh, no, we don't pay. We don't pay unless there are pictures. Well, there weren't any pictures. So what's the point of giving somebody? I don't get the whole thing. Yeah. I don't get it. But, mm. yeah, I think people just want to feel like they're in the know and just... I think it's, a, it's a, a, like a logistical, like, conundrum of once you've told somebody the story or given them the asset... Like, what leverage do you have? Now they know. Yeah. <laughs> like, I've got something. How do you negotiate a price for something that they don't know? Oh, and then I see. once they do know. Oh, I see. Once they do know, I how are they? I don't know how that works, actually. Good point. I never yeah, thought about it. Like so I've them. got something. Right. Yeah. How it's... much are you going to give me? But as he said, he didn't. He said, no, we don't give right. money unless there are pictures. So maybe that's when you. I honestly don't know if somebody like Radar Online. I mean, I don't know. I really don't know. Like Maybe that, then, if you got the picture, yeah, yeah, that, uh, the stereotypical moment of like handing the briefcase <laughs> and like taking the hostage, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know. I mean, um, yeah. I, like, you're, you're lovely, and and I love to consider you a friend. 
oh, you know what? I love that about you. And I do consider you a friend. And you're such a good friend. You're actually going to come to my Van Bump Dog Foundation gala in Let's two do months. It. When, when is yeah, it? It's uh, May the 18th. It's kind Ooh, of sold out. So you have, you have to come as my guest. I will be back from my next Australia tour. Oh, when are you going there? Uh, the, I, I believe I'm back on May 11th. Okay, great. So I can so, sleep yeah, for a week. For sure. <laughs> yeah, well, it's all about the dogs. We haven't had the gala for... Um, three years now because of COVID. Mario Lopez, who's one of the kindest people yeah. on the planet. Do you know Mario? I've, I've met oh, him a bunch of times. It's I always love been him. a him. Him and his wife, experience. so nice, decent, no drama. He always just said, Lisa, of course I want to host it. It's such a great charity. Let yeah. me do this. And like so calm and easy. Just uh, So he'll be hosting it. We'll have just some great people there. It's a lot of fun. Everybody does dress up. Don't come in your t-shirt. Come in something okay. you can do, like you know. I, I, I enjoy it, dressing up. Bring your wife. Yeah, I, yeah. I so, enjoy. Yeah, it. it's dressed up, we love and it. it's a fabulous sight. And you know, whatever we raise, it all goes to the dogs. And we take on in our foundation, you know, situations that nobody like the dogs did. in China. Yeah. Well, we have a sanctuary in China, but you know, we take on a lot of hopeless cases that you know otherwise the dog would be euthanized. You know, like. And so Vanderpump Dog Foundation, if anybody's interested in it, go to VanderpumpDogs.org. My gala is sold out now, even though it's not for a couple of months. It's, uh, I think people, you know, have always yeah. been amazing mm. in terms of supporting it. But we have just great sponsors, um, you know, Caesars Palace sponsors, uh, JSX. I don't know if you know. Jet Suite. Yeah. We fly uh, tomorrow on them. Oh, okay. <laughs> they are brilliant. Yeah. Jet Suite, the best model. In fact, there's a picture of me on the side of the plane with dogs on one of their planes wow. because they oh, wow. really wow. support the Vanderpump Dog Foundation. I've seen that brand grow. Jet Suite X is it's such a brilliant model, it you is. know, uh, of the way they kind of, it makes travel so much easier. I, I love them. I mean, they just, they're, and also you can take your dog with you easily. Yeah. You know, you can either buy a seat next to you or a small dog on, but very easily. Um, we just got a lot of great supporters. You know, people love our four-legged furry friends. And I think now, domestically we've adopted and found good homes for i think about 2800 dogs just in la county Great. um and then we go out like as i say we've been involved in peru and mexico and all different you know we go to disaster relief and you know we try and help with animals we have um a homeless uh, program that we work with, you know, a lot of homeless people have dogs that need spare nutrient and yeah. vaccination. And then we have um, a veterans program where we've trained dogs to be, you know, uh, PTSD dogs. So there's a lot of things. And we fought against the Yulin Dog Meat Festival. Yeah. Mm. So I did a, a, a documentary, which actually, yes, it is hard to watch a lot of it. But, you know, when people say, oh, I can't, I can't, I've got to right. look away. If I looked away, and I love dogs more than people, I worship their little furry paws, that, you know, walk on. I just, we can't look away in right. life. It, sometimes it has to cause you pain for you to be right. motivated to do something different. And so we've been really active. We marched to the embassy. You we did to Congress? A, I did go to Congress. Thank and, you. And you got Resolution the Resolution 401. Yeah, it was mm. to end the dog meat trade. Put it in the diplomatic portfolio. So that's, yeah, to condemn the dog meat trade. Um, we have fought against China and really drawn attention. We did a, a, a documentary as well that's on Amazon. And it was just a fight. And we keep going. And we've drawn a lot of attention to it. You should go to China <clears throat> when the dog meat a uh, festival is on you should go with a baseball bat and like god actually i shouldn't be inciting violence but you they should go are. and protest i mean it's just so <laughs> horrifying the fact that this dog festival in china that they're they're if i understand correctly the idea is to eat the meat of the dog and that some they they believe that the more fear and pain that the dog experiences that the the more valuable the dog's meat is is that i well what if you i mean the uh, documentary as i say is it, it what's I, it I, called and where do people find it uh the road to yulin beyond yeah the road, road to, to yulin. yulin yeah it's um 
we've shed so many tears over it. You know, I've seen Ken. Ken was thrown off Twitter a few times when he you would ever see, you know, some images. That he'd be like, oh, I'm going to, you know, like, he really reacted yeah. very kind and, of separately. And where, where is this uh, documentary available? Um, on Amazon. Yeah. On Amazon. Yeah. And um, it was just, it was something that really motivated us to try and make a difference. I believed I have a platform, and I do believe that if you're a celebrity and you have all these kind of, you know, unbelievable gestures and privileges bestowed upon you, and of course there's a lot of things that are hard to deal with as well, you know, stories that aren't true, that people like, right. you know, you, there's a lot of that we know that's difficult to deal with, but you have a social responsibility to draw attention to some, you know, for the greater good. So for me it was always, you know, suicide prevention, it was LGBTQ issues. It was the the dogs, and that was just something I believed is the way of giving back. I mean, we used to yeah. feed the homeless from one of my restaurants, Villa Blanca, that closed down for twelve years. Every week, every week, we'd cook the food and take it before housewives, before this. You know, I believe everybody has. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter if you can't afford to, even if you do one little thing. It's just like yeah. even with donations, you know, a, even if it's a dollar donation, like sometimes we'll actually do dollar donations. We'll have a hopeless case, a dog left on the side of the road or needs, you know, it's it's a lot of work. But I've got an incredible group of people, people volunteer, people dedicate their lives for the love of dogs. So, yeah, yeah without them, we... We couldn't do anything. Yeah. Do you like the way that the dog's uh, paws smell? Uh, I don't really sniff the paws. I sniff the ears. I'm okay. a big ear sniffer. <laughs> but, yeah, I just love them. I just think they're, <laughs> they're so smart as yeah. well. People don't realize how smart they are. It's Even, so like, their, their sense of smell, what they can detect, and they're, they're just mm -hmm. incredible. You know, listen, I love all animals. Um, I'm kind of vegetarian i eat for the chicken but apart from that i'm like yeah I'm, i haven't eaten any meat other than seafood for over 14 years that's really good yeah i i just have such an iron deficiency and i've been anemic so many times i thought okay i'm gonna try and eat a little bit right. but uh yeah and and i love the fact i love people that love dogs i love you see a certain kindness in yeah. people, you know, the way they treat their animals. And, uh, yeah, it was very devastating to see what goes right. on at the Yulin Dog Meat Festival. And there was a lot of, you know, where they would boil the dogs alive. Ugh. And you see these dogs trying to clamber out of pots. Ugh. Or you see them hang up and beaten with a baseball bat. I mean, just terrible, terrible, terrible videos. Um, so, yeah, it's been a lot of heartbreak over that. But, you know, life's about what you do and yeah. making a difference, isn't it? So we just do what we can, and that's, you know. I love that. Okay, so we're going to send everybody to watch The Road to Yulon on yeah, Amazon. Yeah, yeah. some of it's it's hard to watch. I, right. I, but I think education is what is behind right. motivation, you know. And, you know, whether or not you watch The Road to Yulon, maybe if you feel that you can't stomach it, you can absolutely donate to... Vanderpumpdogs.org, yeah. Vanderpumpdogs.org. Dogs but even if it's, like, look at our missions and what we do. Um, you know, as I say, it's been hard. It's actually been hard keeping the foundation going. I'm a working woman. You know how I made a lot of money for my foundation? Because when COVID hit, I thought, how are we going to keep this going? All our restaurants are closed. I've got all these dogs, got the sanctuary in China. What am I going to do? How am I going to keep this, like funding this foundation when our businesses were all shut down? So Lance Bass, very good friend of mine. Have you ever had him on here? Um, I have not had Lance Bass oh, on here. Oh, you will love him. Okay. Great, 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 great guy. I've got mother to his children. Very kind of, a lot of fun, but very kind. He actually, they do a lot of fostering and they've had dogs, helped us with our dogs for years. But he said to me, oh, have you ever done Cameo? And I was like, no. Ah. And so he said, oh, you should do Cameo. He said, I do Cameo and, and he donates some of the charities. So I thought, okay, I'm going to set up Cameo um, and I'm going to donate all the money from Cameo to my dog foundation. And I don't care how many Cameos I do, I'm going to do literally as many, you know, that come in if I yeah. can. Well, now I've been on it, like, since COVID, 
$398,000 later. That's how <laughs> wow. many cameos I've done. <laughs> wow. And that's kind of been, apart from fundraising and us giving money personally, has Jeez. kept one of the things that kept it going. And it was tenacious. It was ambitious. I keep going. I still do it. as I do as many as I great. can. But all the money goes to the dogs. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. It's, it's another reason why I love you. Oh, right back at you. All right, so um, and, and and Instagram and stuff. You're you're on all yeah, the social I'm on, media. Yeah, Lisa Vanderpump. I mean, and Vanderpump Dogs has their own Instagram. You see what we do, but right. um, mine's kind of like it's visual and it's pretty right. and it's good. Uh, yeah, and I just I keep doing what I love, and you know, and just keep moving forward. I, I love it, and I love you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having Thank me. <laughs> all right. Good deal. Yeah, that really was wonderful. Oh, you're so sweet. Thanks. And um, let me see here. I'm going to go ahead. Oh, yeah, look, let me give you my number. Yeah. We never, yeah. Yeah, that's that's my girl. How about that? Did I tell you we were buddies or what? And I'll have you know that after this, she said, let's have dinner. Just, uh, you know, me and Lux. Invited to dinner by Lisa Vanderpump. I'm so taking her up on that. Um, Love her, man. She's the best. And I love you for sticking around to the end of the Wild Ride podcast. And if any of uh, the new people who just came for Lisa Vanderpump, this is a thing that we do at the Wild Ride podcast. I express my gratitude to those of you who stick around to the end. And I say, hey, man, if you really enjoyed this, then go ahead and post a screenshot of the podcast on whatever device you're consuming it. And post that screenshot tagging my guest, Lisa Vanderpump. Let her know that you enjoyed the podcast. I always love it if uh, my guests see it online, that people are getting giving positive feedback. It makes them feel good about having done the Wild Ride podcast. And uh, it's just a good vibe, man. And whenever I see those posts, man, I like and I comment to show my gratitude to you. So putting that out there, the people who do that, I call the street team, the Wild Ride street team. And they're my favorite people in the world. And that is you. Thank you so much.